Okay class, it's time for our third installment for erythropoiesis and I'm going to begin this segment by talking about how our body removes aging, dying, worn out red blood cells. First of all, a typical red blood cell has a lifespan of about 120 days, so roughly about four months. Now, red blood cells, I'll remind you, are membranous sacs of hemoglobin and other solutes. They do not have organelles. And that means that as a red blood cell is moving through the circulatory system, and especially in the capillaries where they have to bend over and shimmy their way through the capillary bed, they are susceptible to incredible amounts of mechanical stress, and they lack the organelles to repair that damage. So it is not out of the realm of um, imagination to think about how the red blood cell membrane is becoming more and more compromised. Proteins, they can go through considerable amounts of damage, even hemoglobin, and basically the red blood cells are going to get worn out. And they have only the means of anaerobic uh, uh, pathways to make ATP, so their ATP store or ATP values are very limited, and that means limited amounts of cellular energy for the replacement of worn out parts. Um, so they they can't repair themselves, and eventually they need to be removed. Now, where are they removed? They are removed from the circulation in the liver and the spleen. In these two organs, we have macrophages. Now, students oftentimes forget the cells that are involved in red blood cell removal. It is the macrophage that will first phagocytize the red blood cell. And in this top right picture, you're seeing a macrophage that has engulfed four red blood cells. So macrophages are very powerful phagocytic cells. And basically, the liver and spleen have reticular tissue. I'm trying to graphically show you this in the bottom right picture where you see a blue chain link fence and the red blood cells need to shimmy their way through the reticular fibers as shown here by the black arrow going through the chain link fence. Well if a red blood cell membrane is compromised and too rigid or stiff, the red blood cells get hung up on the reticular fibers and then the macrophages come down, slithering down those reticular fibers and engulf the red blood cells as shown here by the young man eating a donut. Now once the macrophages ingest the red blood cell, or phagocytize I should say, then the contents of the red blood cell either need to be destroyed and removed from the body or in many circumstances the parts of a red blood cell can be recycled and used for new red blood cells. Let me explain. So this is a picture showing how a red blood cell is processed. And again, we start with the macrophage inside the liver or spleen. The macrophage will phagocytize the red blood cell. And let's say we're going to start with the globin chains, the alpha and beta globin chains. Now those proteins can be broken down through hydrolysis into free amino acids that are released into the bloodstream and the amino acids can be used by any cell in the body for protein synthesis. Now the heme is broken down. I'll remind you that heme is the iron plus the protoporphyrin ring. So the heme is broken down to the iron and then the iron can be released into the bloodstream. It can bind to apotransferrin. When apotransferrin binds to iron, it is now called transferrin. And then the iron can be released into cells of the body and stored as ferritin. If there is iron overload, then it will be converted into hemosiderin, which is iron precipitating out of the cytoplasmic fluid. And this is very toxic. So again, this is all happening in a macrophage found either in the liver or spleen. Now the other portion of the heme group, once the iron is released, is the por uh, protoporphyrin ring. And this is converted into a substance called bilirubin. 
This cannot be recycled. So the free bilirubin will be extruded from the macrophage, and this is not really soluble very well in the blood plasma. So when this is released by the macrophage into the blood plasma, it's going to bind to albumin. So uh, this free bilirubin is released into the plasma. It's <coughs> carried through the blood plasma by binding to albumin. <clears throat> until that bilirubin can get to a second cell. Now the second cell that's involved in this process is the hepatocyte, which is a cell in the liver. Now the free bilirubin is taken up by the hepatocyte through endocytosis, and inside the hepatocyte a second molecule is bound to the bilirubin, glucuronic acid. Now when glucuronic acid is um, bound to the bilirubin, we now say it's conjugated bilirubin, shown here as the purple and orange dots glued together, conjugate, to marry together, like a conjugal visit in a prison, you know what I'm talking about? Now this conjugated bilirubin is released into the bile, and of course bile is extruded from the liver, and through the, um, the hepatic ducts. And then, of course, bile is stored in the gallbladder until it can be released when you are eating your food that has a lot of fat. Then the bile is released through the bile duct. And, of course, the bile duct then is going to release bile through the hepatopancreatic ampulla into your small intestine. Now, what kind of problem are you going to have if you have an excessive amount of bilirubin accumulating in your bloodstream, either free or conjugated. You're going to have a yellow appearance to you, and we say that you have jaundice. Now, it's important for clinicians to know exactly which type of bilirubin is the problem. Is it the conjugated type, or is it the free bilirubin type? And it turns out, if and we can measure both. We, we draw the patient's blood, and it's easy to measure whether or not it's the free or conjugated to the glucuronic acid. Um, and I'll, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, when the conjugated bilirubin is excreted into the intestines through the bile duct, the conjugated bilirubin is converted to stercobilinogen. And some of the, and the stercobilinogen has a brown color. So that's the reason why your feces appear brown. Now, some of the conjugated bilirubin, the, the reason why it gets conjugated is so that it's more water soluble and easier to pass out of your body. Some of the conjugated bilirubin <coughs> that's excreted with the bile is actually reabsorbed back into the body. And <coughs> the, f the conjugated bilirubin then is going to be filtered by the kidneys and can end up in your urine. So one way or the other, it's going to get out of your body. But while the conjugated bilirubin is going through the kidney tubules, it gets converted into urobilinogen. And this is the reason why your urine is yellow. <coughs> so the reason why your urine is yellow and your feces are brown is really because of the bilirubin found in those waste products and the bilirubin, of course, is stemming from your red blood cells being destroyed by the macrophages. So it's all coming from that protoporphyrin ring. Now, speaking of jaundice, like I said, it's important for the clinicians to know exactly which form of bilirubin is the culprit for the jaundice. Now let's talk about hemolytic jaundice. Let's say you have an excessive destruction of red blood cells that outmatches the synthesis of the red blood cells. Remember that bathtub analogy I gave you in the previous segment? Well, if you have excessive amounts of red blood cells that are being he, um, uh, destroyed, hemolyzed, then you're going to have an excessive buildup of free bilirubin. Now, who, where could this happen? This most notably happens in jaundice of the newborn, 
when the baby is born and out of the good environment of the pregnancy hormones, this leads to an excessive destruction of fetal red blood cells. It is very normal for babies to have jaundice. So their jaundice is a reflection of the increased destruction of red blood cells and it's free bilirubin. How can we help them? Well, I'll remind you that the liver at this point in the newborn is being overly taxed. It's very difficult for the hepatocytes to stay in, in um, to, to perform as well as the baby's macrophages are performing when they are engulfing the red blood cells. So the liver is overwhelmed. <clears throat> so the baby has an excessive amount of a free bilirubin. We can help that baby, I'll remind you, the free bilirubin is not as water soluble. Putting the baby out in the sunlight to get a little phototherapy, I'm not I'm not saying leave your baby out in the sun for an hour so that they get a you know third degree burn, sunburn. But um, what I am saying is put them out in the sun, pull up their little onesie, get a little phototherapy on their chest for you know just a few minutes and the sunlight helps convert the free bilirubin into a more water soluble form and it's easier for the baby to get it out of their body. The other way we can help is um, sometimes the baby needs a little extra help, they go to the doctor, they're very jaundiced, they might prescribe billy lights and the billy lights you wrap them around your baby and they literally look like those tube Christmas lights so your baby is like this day glow alien and those billy lights are really UV phototherapy. It's the same thing that I was telling you with the sunlight. That UV phototherapy is helping convert the free bilirubin into a more water soluble form and therefore it's easier for the baby to pass it out of their body and their urine and feces. Now let's pretend a person has jaundice because of, of an obstructed bile duct. This can happen do you remember me telling you about the person who is the alcoholic and with the um, <coughs> uh, liver being destroyed, the liver or being too focused on detoxifying the blood, the liver doesn't make as much albumin, right? And we learned about the ascites and when we learned about our body fluid compartments in class. Well, the excessive fluid from the ascites can basically obstruct the bile duct and this can lead to a, a condition called portal hypertension. Anyway, in this case then the bile can't get through the bile duct because it's kinked like a hose kinked if you will and therefore the rate of conjugated bilirubin is still fine but the conjugated bilirubin is not passed out through the bile. Now, so alcoholics can have jaundice because of conjugated bilirubin, but I also want you to know with severe alcoholism and the liver is being destroyed, the number of hepatocytes, uh, functional hepatocytes is compromised. In a severe alcoholic who has jaundice, I am telling you, both their free bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin levels can be elevated. Expect both. But in the case of someone who has an obstructed bile duct because they have a um, gallstone, then that person's liver is still fine. They wouldn't have excessive amounts of free bilirubin. In that example, it would be a buildup of the conjugated bilirubin that can cause them to have jaundice. Now, in the middle picture here, you are seeing some stool and urine, and you're noticing that the feces are clay colored. This reflects that the bile is not getting out. The person is not getting the conjugated bilirubin out into their intestines and therefore the stercobilinogen is not made and so the feces appear white. So if you have white feces, you should go to the doctor because you probably have an obstructed bile duct, probably because of a gallstone. Now that means the conjugated bilirubin that's accumulating in the bloodstream only has one way out of the body and that's by being filtered by the kidneys and then passed out in the urine as urobilinogen. And so the urine appears extremely orange, almost brown like when that conjugated bilirubin is coming out only through uh, the, the urine. Now, 
a special scenario. Consider a, a bruise, an ecchymosis. Um, the beautiful colors that we see with a bruise reflect the tissue macrophages uh, engulfing the red blood cells that have accumulated in that part of the body where there has been a torn blood vessel. The, that tissue ser served by that torn blood vessel accumulates blood. The macrophages gobble up the red blood cells and as we watch the dark bruise turn into green and yellow colors, it reflects the porphyrin being converted into a, a type of bilirubin called uh, biliverde, which verde means green, and then as it's continued to be processed into the free bilirubin, we see the yellow color. So we see the green, and then we see the yellow, and we know that the bruise, the ecchymosis, is fading away. Pretty interesting, huh? Now I'd like to talk to you about some red blood cell pathologies and I'm going to begin this talk with polycythemia. Now there are a few ways you can get polycythemia. First, what would you predict polycythemia would do to a person's blood viscosity and uh, therefore their blood flow? With increased red blood cells, the blood vis viscosity would increase. And this means that the heart is going to have to work harder as a pump to push that very viscous blood through the vasculature. And if the heart cannot do that, then that means blood flow to the tissues will be compromised. Sort of think of it like molasses being pushed through your blood vessels. So polycythemia needs to be considered. This is a clinical issue. Now, when you have relative polycythemia, this occurs when a person is dehydrated. If, say, a person has been sweating excessively, they've lost some of their plasma volume in the form of sweat. And that means the remaining red blood cells are packed in a smaller volume. So this kind of relative polycythemia, the way we treat it, is simply by rehydrating the patient. Give them something to drink or maybe an IV saline solution. So we don't blood let them. It's not a problem with excessive production of red blood cells. Rather, the red blood cells they have is now found in a smaller volume. And again, it's because we've lost some plasma volume in the form of sweat. When we sweat, we don't lose our red blood cells. Now, the Nike commercials would like to think that when you sweat, you lose some blood. But that's not true. We know that's not true, right? Now, another type you can, another way you can get polycythemia is called polycythemia vera, shown here in the red font. Now, this is a stem cell disorder. This is overproduction of red blood cells from the hemocytoblast. Now, when this happens, this is called polycythemia vera or primary polycythemia. Expect both terms. In this case, this the kidneys, think about your negative feedback loops, right? The kidneys are going to detect more than normal oxygen, and therefore the levels of erythropoietin would decrease. So in a patient with polycythemia vera, we would expect them to have elevated counts of red blood cells, elevated hematocrit, that would be high, but EPO levels would be very, very low. Can you portray this graphically? Can you make a graph with X and Y axes where EPO is on the X axis and hematocrit would be on the Y axis? How would you plot these values for a patient with polycythemia vera? How would you plot EPO versus hematocrit in a normal person? So these are fun games to play. Now, what about secondary polycythemia? Secondary polycythemia is, a, is an adaption. And we are not as concerned with this clinically like we are with polycythemia vera. With polycythemia vera, of course, we got to treat the cancer, the, 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 um, the overproduction of the red blood cells coming from the hemocytoblast. It's a bone marrow issue. We can bloodlet the person in that case, but in secondary polycythemia, 
It is an adaptive response. People who live in Denver, Colorado have secondary polycythemia. People who go up to Mount Everest and then they come down off the mountain would have secondary polycythemia. It's an adaptive response due to low oxygen content in the air and therefore their kidneys release excessive amounts of EPO. How would you map or graph that on your graph that I just ask you, asked you to do? So EPO levels are high and hematocrit is increased. But once those people come down off the mountain, give them a couple weeks, what would happen to their EPO levels? What would happen to their red blood cell? We account. So in other words, we don't go to Denver and find people with the pol well, if we went to Denver, we would find people with polycythemia, but we wouldn't treat them by saying, you need to donate blood. It's an adaptive response. They need that secondary polycythemia. In whom else would we find secondary polycythemia, but not necessarily living on a mountain or elevated um, uh, places? Uh, well, a pregnant woman. In a pregnant woman, of course, we recognize she's got this parasite inside of her. I say that, of course, as a joke. But the parasite is taking her oxygen. In a pregnant woman, her kidneys would detect a reduced oxygen content. In a pregnant woman, her EPO levels are high. Again, this is an adaptive response to the pregnancy. We don't bloodlet the pregnant woman. This secondary polycythemia will go away on its own after she births the baby. So there really is no treatment uh, per se for secondary polycythemia. I mean, at best, um, we might we might give them some ox but we don't we don't really treat secondary polycythemia. It is an adaptive response. Now I'm going to begin our talk on anemias. Now I like this slide for studying purposes. I've organized your anemias into different conditions. Now anemia, strictly defined, is a condition, a condition where the blood has abnormally low oxygen carrying capacity. That is the proper definition of anemia. Far too many textbooks say anemia is low hematocrit. That's not always the case. So um, anemia is low oxygen carrying capacity. Now you can have low oxygen carrying capacity for two broad categories. Either you've had blood loss, either through hemorrhage or rapid destruction of your red blood cells, or you can have low carrying capacity from deficient red blood cell production. Deficient production. Now again, remember our bathtub analogy. We want steady state levels of red blood cells. How can we have an abnormal, um, how can we have abnormal values? We can either have excessive removal of red blood cells or we can have not enough synthesis of red blood cells. Those are our two broad categories. Now people with anemia oftentimes complain of shortness of breath. They have dyspnea or air hunger. They are often fatigued and they are cold. And again, red blood cells are most numerous formed element. They help with maintaining our, our, uh, our heat. They are sacks of water, and water, of course, has a high heat in it or specificity. It helps retain heat, so if you don't have enough red blood cells, then you would not be able to retain your heat. You would feel cold, fatigued, again, because tissues are not getting enough oxygen. Why the shortness of breath? Part of the reflex arc is to increase your breathing rate, so someone feels like they're breathing faster and they just can't get enough air into their lungs. Now I'm going to go through all of these categories shown in orange and in the salmon color, in the yellow color, and the blue. We're going to go through each one. So again, two broad categories, how we can get reduced oxygen carrying capacity. Either the red blood cells you have are being destroyed excessively or you are not making adequate amounts of red blood cells. 
So deficient production versus rapid removal. Very, very important. Now, for all of these types of anemias that I'm going to go through in the different colors, I want you to play a game with me. Now go ahead and write this down. I want you to write MCHC. I'll remind you that means mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. MCHC equals MCH over MCV. So MCHC equals MCH divided by MCV. And I gave you the example of if we had a hundred people in our class and 34 of them were female, then the females would be 34 percent of the class, right? So we have 32 picograms of hemoglobin in a cell volume of about a hundred so this gives us an idea of how, what percent of a red blood cell consists of hemoglobin. In some of these anemias, the MCH might be affected or the MCV might be affected. And then we need to predict what would happen to MCHC. Let's play a game. Let's say you are taking a test. Let's say you have a hundred points on this test, a hundred possible points. Let's say you get 70 points correct. What is your percentage? 70 percent, correct? And you might be thinking this is a low C. Okay, what if your instructor suddenly said, you know what, I think 10 of these questions were not fair. So now the test is out of 90 you still have a 70, but the test is scored out of 90 points now. What would happen to your, your percent now? Would it go up or down? Would you be happy as a student or sad? In this case, your percentage on that test would go up, correct? So I want you to think of that game with red blood cells. What if the red blood cell has hemoglobin in it, but the cell starts to shrink, just like that test example. Well, then the MCHC would go up, right? What if the reverse were true? What if MCH is held steady, but the cell is larger? Now, to go to our test reference, that's like me saying, you know what? You had a 70 on the test, but the, the test had 10 problems on the back that you didn't see, the test is worth 110 points, not 100. Are you sad as a student or happy? Now you have a 70 out of 110. That is not now a 70 percent, correct? And you don't have a C, you now have a D. So in cells that get larger but still have the same amount of hemoglobin, their MCHC would go down. The percentage of that hemoglobin to total volume would go down. So I'm going to be pointing out changes, types of anemia that have changes in MHC or MCV or MCHC and you should play that game. If you know two of those three values, can you predict what will happen to the third? And in your lab manual, there are several questions that help give you practice with this concept. All right, let's begin our talk on the anemias. Again, I'm going to go through them, and the slides are color-coded to go with this slide. So I think it's wise to print this slide, and then as we go through all the, the anemias, take your notes on this slide. It's just my recommendation. Let's start with the deficiencies. Again, deficient red blood cell production. How can this happen? Well, one way this can happen is through iron deficiency. If you are not getting adequate iron intake in your diet, then you cannot make your hemoglobin um, well and your red blood cell production is going to be compromised. So um, in this case, people who are more likely to have iron deficiency would be children or women who are pregnant because that parasite is taking the woman's iron from her blood. This is um, usually associated with strange eating habits too. In the case of 
women or uh, women who are pregnant and children. Now this leads to pica. Now pica means the person has strange food cravings. Uh, you might see children eating dirt and you wonder why. They have these strange cravings for the dirt and it really is the body trying to find sources of iron and you can find iron in dirt. So my mom remembers her youngest sister eating, taking plants out of the pots and eating the potting soil. She had pica. She was likely in a state of iron deficiency and anemic. Now, one of the classic, classic signs of someone who has iron deficiency anemia is they will oftentimes present in your clinical setting with a sore throat because the epithelial lining starts to die and slough off because it's not getting adequate amounts of oxygen. So usually the person will present with pale gums and sore throat and this is a very good indication that you should you know draw the blood and find out if they have anemia. Now in this case iron deficiency will lead to cells that are hypochromic, remember chromasia, not adequately packed with hemoglobin. The cells are extremely small, microcytic, and that means they have, and also um, uh, poikilocytotic. So I want you to think of the MCV going down, the MCHC is also down. If you're doing your little equation, MCHC and MCH and, M and MCV, write it out, MCHC equals MCH over MCV. In this case of anemia, the amount of hemoglobin in the cell is going down, the size of the cell is going down and students oftentimes think that they decrease proportionally and therefore students erroneously think MCHC would not change. This is not true. MCH decreases far more than MCV. So it's a very small number in the, in the numerator compared to a smaller number in the denominator. So in this case, all three decrease. Now, I also want you to know that if someone has chronic blood loss, if they have hemorrhagic anemia that is chronic, say because of a bleeding ulcer, I want you to associate with this tipping the scales into iron deficiency because they won't be able to keep up with the intake of iron in their diet to match the increased need for more red blood cell synthesis. So chronic hemorrhage will lead to iron deficiency. I'm going to get you with that on a test question, so pay attention. Chronic hemorrhage will lead to iron deficiency anemia. Now this picture on the bottom right is just reminding you how we get iron from our diet. The iron is absorbed into the bloodstream and binds to apotransferrin, turning it into transferrin. And then the iron is released into a protein into the cells where a protein inside the cells, apoferritin, will bind to iron and store it appropriately as ferritin. And you're seeing that happen in the liver as an example. And then the iron can be used, of course, by other cells in the body to make hemoglobin all over again. Moving on to aplastic anemia. With aplastic anemia, it is bone marrow failure. With primary aplastic anemia, we don't know what the cause is for the bone marrow failure. Cells, the red blood cell count starts to decrease. The red blood cells that are there are fine and made normally, so they have normal MCH, normal MCV, normal MCHC. It's just the numbers of red blood cells are drastically reduced. Secondary aplastic anemia means we know what the problem is and this is causing the bone marrow failure, but we know it can be um, immune suppression of the stem cells, it could be from exposure to radiation or chemicals like pesticides, um, I have benzene on here, 
Some people have an idiosyncratic response to antibiotics where it, the antibiotic that they are taking, like chloramphenicol as an example, can lead to the bone marrow being, dep um, the stem cells being depleted. So secondary means we know the cause. Now you can also have a special type, a, another kind of special classification of aplastic anemia is called hypoproliferative anemia. And this now is, is caused from the kidney releasing less erythropoietin, less than it should. And this can be caused from renal failure, like I was telling you, renal disease, or chronic infections. But it is a problem with the kidneys not doing their job correctly and it leads to reduced erythropoietin. And there are other ways that this can happen as well, a hypometabolic state that I have on here. But hypoproliferative from renal disease will be our classroom example for testing purposes. Now, another type of anemia from a deficient production of them is megaloblastic anemias. In this case, it is a coenzyme deficiency from either folic acid or vitamin B12. And I'm going to explain what coenzymes are. But these two coenzymes are required for the synthesis of thymidine. And if you don't have uh, appropriate amounts of thymidine, if you go back to the beginning part of this lecture where I said, what are the ingredients we need for proper erythropoiesis? Well, we need nucleotides and we need the nucleotides for the DNA synthesis to occur in the hemocytoblast so it can replicate and divide correctly and also the, the erythrocyte precursor cells, the pro-erythrocyte, also replicates and divides. So if you have a shortage of thymidine, you cannot replicate your DNA. In this case, the cell production is fewer but they are larger. So the red blood cells as they are being formed, there are fewer amounts of them because you couldn't allow cell division. And the cells focus mostly on protein synthesis. I'll remind you, messenger RNA doesn't require thymidine. It doesn't use it. Uracil is used instead. So if the cell can't replicate and divide, it focuses its efforts on protein synthesis. And this is a question in your homework packet that probably was getting you. So fewer cells, but larger to accommodate more protein synthesis. So the cells are megaloblastic, irregularly shaped, poikilocytotic, and because they are so swollen, they have fragile membranes. In this case, if we're playing our game with our equation, we would have increased MCV, we have increased amounts of MCH, and in this case, the increase is proportional. This is different than the decreases we saw in the previous examples where MCH for iron deficiency, the decrease was much, much more than the decrease in MCV. No, in this case, the megaloblastic anemias, the increase of MCH and MCV are proportional and therefore, the MCHC is the same. How can I explain this to you? If you got a 50 out of 100 on a test, what's your percent? 50 percent. Well, if you took a test that had 200 points but you scored 100, you still would have a 50 percent, right? So in this case, the MCH and MCV are going up proportionally and therefore the overall MCHC, the concentration, stays the same. Now, what is a coenzyme? A coenzyme is a substance that helps an enzyme do its job better. I like to use the analogy of my, my little thumb drive and the computer and the overhead projection unit. I am the enzyme facilitating your learning. But all the computer, my thumb drive with my PowerPoints and the overhead projector, they help me do my job better. We would be in a world of hurt 
if I didn't have all those pictures to show you and you had to rely on me drawing everything on the blackboard or a whiteboard. I cannot, I, there's a reason why I became a scientist. I am not a good artist. You should ask me how I draw a cat and I will show you. It's pathetic. Never have me as a partner for Pictionary. So you get the point. If I am the enzyme doing my job of teaching you something without all of these ancillary things around to help me do my job, we would take forever to get through the content. So a coenzyme is something that helps an enzyme do its job better. And frequently the coenzyme has to bind to an alternative binding spot on the enzyme itself. And when it's not there, we say the enzyme is an apoenzyme. It, need, it doesn't have its proper conformation. Once the substance, the coenzyme, binds to that alternative binding site, then the binding site for the substrate to bind becomes available. And that I'm trying to show you that here now. So our coenzyme, vitamin B12, or folic acid, binds to the enzyme and now we can have proper uh, thymidine production in that pr in the previous example that I gave you. So basically the binding site becomes available to the substrates and then the enzyme can do its job and form the product. So that's what a coenzyme is. It is an organic substance. Alright, so now moving on to more discussion on megaloblastic anemias. Again, those coenzymes are extremely important for thymidine production. We get folic acid in our green leafy vegetables. We get vitamin B12 from meat and dairy and eggs. We store both of them in the liver and we have many months to years worth of supply. In the case of folic acid, about six to nine months worth of a stored supply. For vitamin B12, about three to five years. Now, um, when can we have a problem with this? Well, obviously someone with poor nutrition or who, someone who is uh, drinking their diet, say in the alcoholic, they can end up having megaloblastic anemias. And um, another example, if someone has intestinal sprue or celiac disease and they have poor ability to absorb these, uh, these coenzymes, they can end up having megaloblastic anemia. Now a special clinical con consideration is for vitamin B12. I'll remind you from anatomy, parietal cells in the stomach are responsible for not only releasing hydrochloric acid, but intrinsic factor as well. And you need this intrinsic factor in order for your small intestines to absorb vitamin B12. If you do not have enough parietal cells, you won't have enough intrinsic factor and you won't be able to absorb vitamin B12 and you will tip the scales into megaloblastic anemia who might have a problem with the number of their parietal cells. A person who's gone through gastric bypass or have had gastrectomies, part of their stomach removed. In this case, the person is going to have to get a shot of vitamin B12. Why a shot? Why can't they just take a vitamin pill? Well, the vitamin B12 in that vitamin that or pill that they've taken can't be absorbed. So they're going to need a shot. So again, people who have poor nutrition will have a depletion of these coenzymes or people who have a diet that's very strict and they're not getting a good balance. In the case of vitamin B12, special clinical consideration is the gastric bypass or the gastrectomy or gastric atrophy if the stomach is shrinking for whatever reason. They could have a lack of intrinsic factor and therefore they won't have vitamin B12 and they will have megaloblastic anemia. Okay, that is a special test question. I will ask you about a person who has poor nutrition and I'll remind you an alcoholic certainly has poor nutrition. They tend to be drinking their diet instead of eating correctly. 
Last slide for our third installment. I'm starting to a new category. You'll notice the yellow font now. I'm in blood loss category, not deficiencies anymore. The blood loss category, changing topics. And special one to consider is hemorrhagic anemia. This is blood loss. There's nothing wrong with your red blood cells and how they were made. Now you're just pouring them on the floor. So Mr. Great White Shark bit off your arm and you are now blood going into the ocean. The red blood cells you were losing were made normally. So MCH, MCV, MCHC, all normal. If it's acute blood loss, this can lead to hypovolemic shock, and you will learn more about that in Lecture Unit 3. But chronic hemorrhage, notice the blue type to think blue category, will tip the scale into deficiencies, iron deficiency, and the red blood cells will change their size and shape. We will have the reduced MCH, the reduced MCV, and the reduced MCHC. So chronic hemorrhage, say from a bleeding ulcer is an example, can lead to iron deficiency where the iron uptake is not as adequate as the loss of the red blood cells. Now, uh, an interesting thing is obviously we are worried about our soldiers in combat having acute blood loss, right? And leading to reduced oxygen carrying capacity. But it's very difficult out in, in combat to carry around, you know, blood, pints of blood. And obviously it needs refrigeration. So there is a scientist trying to develop plastic blood where all the soldiers would need to do is add water to reconstitute it. And this means they wouldn't have to worry about refrigeration or blood incompatibility. And it still is being formulated if you want to up to, you know, follow this link to see how it's progressing. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic that we are trying to make plastic blood that is obviously not as good as blood, but good for our soldiers to tie them over until they can seek medical treatment in a hospital. All right, that concludes our third installment, and we only have one more left to do.